on 19 July 2021. It's a long journey as far as nationalization is concerned. And these, all this 51 year, 52 years period, uh, we have seen socio-economic uh, changes in uh, our country. Uh, it, it become possible only because of uh, through nationalized banks. And uh, today, while celebrating, we we are we have organized webinars throughout the month, first July to thirty first July. So uh, almost all uh, MPs, politicians, academicians, and uh, social workers and uh, other economists and other uh, dignitary will be uh, uh, giving their lectures on this occasion. Uh, uh, today is the tenth lecture. And uh, we have we are fortunate uh, enough that Mr. Uh, Kumar Ketkarji uh, is a journalist, uh, forward uh, personality, and uh, he was born in 1946, much before uh, Abe was born in uh, 20th April 1960. So uh, our Abe's period. Is completely co uh, is a parallel to uh, his uh, lifetime journey, and sure. he was aware since 1969 when bank was nationalized, or in younger days when uh, he was uh, he has graduated from uh, Mumbai Vidyapeet Bachelor of Arts and his journalist uh, uh, course. So during that period, in early days, uh, there used to be. Uh, 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 Activities, students' activities or uh, social activities, and he came in contact with uh, Dhopeshwarkar and uh, DP Chatta. That is the period when um, uh, 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 this government, uh, uh, led by Mrs. Gandhi, uh, going through a rough weather in his in her party, and that time only 1969, the uh, nationalization uh, in July 19, 1969 nationalization was declared by her. So that complete political situation there, socio-economic situation there in this country, uh, 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 Kumar Ketkarji is well aware, and he had uh, also uh, reported and on various occasions through uh, uh, various newspapers he was attacked. He started his career with the uh, uh, Economic Times, and he was also a chief editor of Marathi Dainik, uh, uh, popular Dainik, uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, Lok Satta and Maharashtra Times, and uh, mm -hmm. his, his book in 1980, Jala Mikicha or by name, is a, uh, on the verge of Volcano, uh, covering the railway strike and other that situation during that period, emergency which was uh, there in 1975. Uh, it, it was very, very well acclaimed, and uh, he has, uh, uh, I mean, written it, uh, a very good book uh, uh, on that background. So he, uh, he is an eminent writer, eminent uh, editor. He, we have grown as an activist in trade union or in our student life or whatever way we are working and social act, uh, work we are doing. We, are, we, are, we have grown with his reading his ed editorials. He is a very good critic, I can say. And uh, his criticism, uh, we, we'll, uh, we have experience uh, all over. And now today he is a Lok Sabha, I mean Rajya Sabha member on uh, Congress ticket uh, in uh, 2018. Prior to that, uh, Bala Sahib Thakre uh, uh, went uh, uh, somewhere, somewhere uh, earlier to that he had offered uh, him this member of Rajya Sabha ticket. But then uh, he uh, at that time on ideological differences, he had uh, preferred to stay away from that. And ultimately in 2018, when uh, Congress offered him uh, this particular uh, uh, Rajya Sabha membership. He has accepted, and now last two three years he has been, <coughs> I mean, debating there in uh, Rajya Sabha. And uh, I think that uh, we have the guest who is uh, uh, accustomed with the situation when AIB is growing with so many struggles. And during that period, uh, as a journalist. He had, uh, 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 I mean, covered all those activities, uh, AIBs or activities. He is well versed with our activities, and uh, 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 as he he has supported it on many or many many times, he has criticized also, and on and to have such guests 
today uh, in uh, our national seminar this uh, webinar uh, it is a, a great pleasure for us and uh, uh, before i uh, hand over uh, mic to him i welcome him on behalf of uh, our uh, all 5000 mem pilak members and plus those who are uh, seeing here i mean this particular webinar almost uh, every day this number is increasing and i uh, i feel that uh, uh, his address will enlighten us and at the end enrich us also uh, over to uh, i welcome in over to uh, padma shri kumar ketkar ji yes can i begin ah yeah, yeah. Yeah, am I audible and visible properly? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, clear. Okay. The fifty-second anniversary of bank nationalisation today needs to be particularly celebrated because it is necessary to understand current political and economic situation not only in India but globally. There are so many misgivings. taking place across the board in all aspects of our political economic and social life go back to 1969 and you will find that the world was different nobody in 1969 could have imagined despite the problems that mrs gandhi encountered while nationalizing banks that one day there will be a government of the bjp led by a person like narendra modi who will try to dismantle not only bank nationalization but the entire edifice the entire legacy of the freedom movement of the socialist movement and of the progressive causes for last 7 years we are seeing in front of our eyes a total elimination even destruction calculated destruction of all the values that we have lived with so far for so many years and certainly not 75 years but more than 75 years in the entire freedom movement i remember i was in the economic times not in 1969 i joined economic times in 1972 but i was during the period prior to bank nationalization and after bank nationalization for the newspapers first in economic times after 1972 so i was connected as was explained i was connected with the trade union movement and because of the trade union movement i was connected with mr dp chandra mr dopesh shortkar and the aibea of officials and of course other trade union movements that were taking place those were the days when trade union movement was extremely strong it had the ability to influence government's policies it had ability to influence people's minds it had ability to influence society in general and the working class in particular looking back we feel that that was a glorious period not necessarily social period but a glorious period and today it has become just a nostalgia there is no trade in the movement active trade in the movement like it was there in the 70s there is no active political progressive movement like it was there in the 70s or 60s there is no particular political leadership in any of the left wing or progressive parties which can take challenge and which can actually accept the gauntlet thrown by the modi and therefore today it is more important it is more significant to remember 1969 and particularly when the talk of denationalization or privatization is taking place there are many among our comrades and colleagues in the banks and elsewhere even in other trade characters that uh, how is it possible for government of india to denationalize because it is an act but let us not forget this government has been able to bulldoze anything but has also been stopped from bulldozing many acts and many actions of theirs they definitely bulldozed the abolition and abrogation of article 370 they bulldozed the agricultural laws against the interests of the farmers and yet they have not been able to implement the agricultural laws nor have they been able to bulldoze but not implement the 
abolition or complete elimination of Article 370. And finally, they were forced to discuss with the parties in Jammu and Kashmir as to how to go ahead despite having completely abrogated Article 370. So it is not as if by simply changing or transforming or abolishing or abrogating laws that they would be able to go ahead. So these misgivings among our comrades that government will not be able to do it, let us forget they will be able to do it as far as the act is concerned, but let us also not remember if the movement is strong, we can stop them in the tracks. Like farmers for last about eight months are protesting on the borders of Delhi. I live in Delhi quite often nowadays and I see those farmers movement and the spirit is as strong as it was eight months ago. So farmers have been able to stop the implementation of the acts and now government is again thinking whether it can be amended while they were sleeping completely and they were saying that in any case we'll implement. Similarly, the Land Acquisition Act which they wanted to implement, they could not implement because of the movement and because of the pressure from the progressive people, progressive parties, progressive media, progressive individuals. So let us not give them, let us not give Modi a power to believe that he can do anything what he wants. And there's nothing like Modi hai to mumkin hai. Modi hai to mumkin nahi bhi hai. Aur humko dikhana hai ki Modi hai fir bhi bohut sari cheeze mumkin nahi hai. But that is in our hands. If we are complacent, if we are inactive, and if we do not mobilize people, and particularly the working class and working employees, and even the peasantry, and even the unemployed youth, we will not be able to actually stop them in the tracks. So it is necessary to recall what trade union movement or people's movement can do by referring to the period of 1960s. 1960, let us begin at 1960, 1960 to 1970, that's why I chose my topic as bank nationalization in the context of the 60s decade. In 1960, globally speaking, John Kennedy was elected in US and in 1961, 20th January, he was sworn in as president. But 1961 is a very crucial year. It was the same year when Soviet Union built a wall in Berlin. And with the coming up of the wall in Berlin, the world was formally divided for the first time after the Second World War. During Second World War, actually Soviet Union United States, England, everybody was together to defeat the Nazis, to defeat the Hitlerite forces. But after 1945, after Hitler killed himself on 30th April 1945, and the German forces surrendered on 8th May 1945, and Japan surrendered after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the world was supposed to be much better but actually, immediately after that began the Cold War. The Cold War context of bank nationalization cannot be ignored because Cold War began immediately after the Second World War was over, but it was formalized in 1961 when the Berlin Wall was built. Immediately after the Berlin Wall was built, the world began to be actually divided in form of alliances those who are for Soviet Union and those who are against Soviet Union. It is the same year, 1961, when Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru decided to take initiative and form non-alignment movement. The NAM was formalized in 1961, the same year when Berlin Wall, Wall was built, and Pandit Nehru mobilized the forces from Yugoslavia, Tito, Tito and Egypt Nasser. Now, Tito, Nasser and Nehru actually created a troika, a new troika in the Cold War. On the one hand, there was Soviet Union. On the other hand, there was the United States. And the superpower struggle had begun and Nehru created a third force that was known as the NAM. I remember in 1962, one year after that, there was a huge march in Delhi to demand bank nationalization. Then bank nationalization demand was essentially from the Bank Employees Union as well as from the Communist Party and even the Socialist Party. That time Nehru was there, but Nehru was still there in 1962. 
In 1964, Pandit Nehru died. And many people in the Congress, particularly those having right-wing beliefs, thought that now that Nehru is dead, many of these socialist-oriented policies of Pandit Nehru could be reversed. But as I said, the forces, progressive forces were so strong that between 62 and 64, they could not really take much action in their hand to implement the right-wing forces, but they thought that after Nehru is there, they will be able to implement it. Therefore, soon after 1964, they began their activities. They began initiating the policies to create a post-Nehru world of what they wished. So actually, the right-wing journey in India, the so-called neoliberalism, as it is known today, it was not known as neoliberalism then. The right-wing neoliberalism actually begins immediately after Pandit Nehru died. In 1965, we had a war with Pakistan. That was the second war in just three years. The 1962 war was with China and 1965 war was with Pakistan. And against this backdrop came a huge economic crisis because the pressure, economic pressure of the war, two wars, was almost unbearable to the economy, which was very young and to a great extent underdeveloped economy. The first and second five-year plan did create some stability, economic stability, but these two wars clearly destroyed that stability and created economic crisis in 1965 onwards. As a result, the debate began in the country and majority of the right-wing intellectuals and the right-wing media began to say that the Nehruvian model is old. It is necessary to resolve the crisis by taking privatization as the first step. Actually, there was no bank nationalized, nothing else. But they thought that privatization, in a sense, no nationalizations more, no state sector more, even before bank nationalization, the argument for private sector, expanding private sector had begun immediately after Pandit Nehru's death. Many of you may recall Ashok Mehta was a socialist and Ashok Mehta had joined later on Congress and he became later on a syndicate Congress member. Ashok Mehta said in public, openly, that time has come for India to open its womb to the private sector and particularly to the international capital, to the global capital. In those days, the word global was not as much in vogue as international. So he wanted the foreign direct investment in today's parlance, to be implemented way back in 1966 by saying that India has to open its womb to welcome the foreign direct investment. There was a big debate and those who were Nehruites at that time, Congress or outside Congress, the leftists, all of them opposed Ashok Mehta's approach and Ashok Mehta himself being a socialist, he created a lot of rustle even among the socialist circles. In 1966, under the tremendous pressure in this economic crisis after the two wars, Mrs. Gandhi was virtually forced or bulldozed into accepting the devaluation of rupee. In 1966, in July, there was devaluation of rupee, which further accentuated the crisis. And when the crisis accentuated, the elections were just in the offing. In 1967, the elections were to be held. And those elections were held against the backdrop of two wars, the economic crisis, the devaluation, and the division, political division within Congress Party and outside Congress Party. So in 1967, when elections were to be held, there was one great socialist, or who is known as a great socialist, but who proved to be a disruptive socialist, Ram Manohar Lohia. He said time has come to eliminate Congress completely. Actually, the idea that India should be Congress smoke was first propagated so publicly in post-independent era was by Ramana Roya. So he said time has come to defeat Congress at the center and if all the opposition parties come together, then Congress can be challenged and Congress can be defeated. This thesis of so-called anti-Congressism and later on it became anti-Indianism and anti-Nehruism, it came in vogue in February 1967 Though in October 1967, Ramon Oloya died, 
his thesis had already started playing its card. As a result, we saw Congress losing election in as many as eight states. In Tamil Nadu, DMK came to power for the first time. And since DMK came to power in 1967, till today, in Tamil Nadu, Congress has not come back or any other party has not come back except, of course, DMK and Anna DMK, its own offspring. So, Tamil Nadu has been held by DMK or Anna DMK since 1967. Initially, Anna Dure was the chief minister and later on Tolna Nidhi, who died two years ago. Now, in Kerala, there was communist government. In 1967, communist government came for the second time. The first time communist government came, that was the first electoral victory of the communists anywhere in the world. And that was in Kerala. And the second victory came in 1967 in the wave of anti communism So Kerala had gone to anti communist forces, but communist forces. Tamil Nadu had gone to BMK. West Bengal had gone to Bangla Congress and communists. Punjab had gone to Akali Dal. Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh had gone to Sayyukta Vidayak Dal. Madhya Pradesh and uh, many such northern states, including Bihar, were actually governed or ruled or were electing the SVD or Sayyukta Vidayak Dal governments. Actually, the BKD of Charan Singh, Bharatiya Dal, was formed in 1967 as a part of this overall political change. So, Congress lost eight states and in parliament also Congress acquired only a very thin majority. So, the debate that had begun immediately after Nehru got further accentuated within the Congress as to why Congress was defeated so badly. So many of the right-wing people, which included Nijlingappa, C.B. Gupta, S.K. Patil, Atulya Ghosh, and many others, they thought that economic policies of Pandit Nehru have been proved to be wasteful and wrong, and time has come to change them. That was one line, which is known as the right Congress, right-wing Congress, Syndicate Congress. That line was also supported, as I said, by Ashok Mehta, who in turn was supported by international lobby led by the World Bank. In 1966, or in those days, in the 1960s, World Bank had much more power to influence the policies of the third world countries. Nowadays, the word third world, or the term third world, is simply not used because many of the third world countries have become so prosperous that they have ceased to be third world, and even non-alignment movement is completely, virtually vanished, though it only remains in the name. Our government has overlooked completely the significance of the non-alignment movement, particularly after the end of Modi came to power. So 1960s, where just as they saw the birth of non-alignment movement, it also saw the birth of more and more World Bank pressure on the developing economies. So in 1967, after the election loss, Congress began to debate further. And as I said, the right wing started pushing its line. And at that particular time, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's advisor was Mr. P. N. Haksa. Or Mrs. Indira Gandhi's other advisors were D.P. Dhar and even Mohan Kumar Mandala, who had joined Congress from the CPI, the Miss Communist Party of India. So Mrs. Indira Gandhi was in the center, pressured from the right and from the left. As a result, the policy option, options had to be taken. What Mrs. Gandhi said in the party in 1968 convention as well as the 1969 convention, the time has come to change direction, but not change direction towards right, but towards left. Similarly, let us not forget that 1967 to 69, there were other developments, and they were the developments of the regional movements. Shiva Sena was born in 1966. As I said, the DMK movement or DK movement in Tamil Nadu 67, Sardarjis, Akalis began to develop their cause Again, in 1966 to 1969, Naxalite movement was also started in 1967 to 1969 period. So there was discontent, but the discontent did not have a unified voice. The discontent did not have a unified ideology. It represented left as well as right. It had Shiv Sena in Mumbai, DMK in Tamil Nadu, and communists in Kerala and Bengal. So it did not have a unified voice. So ideologically, that discontent was completely disparate. Mrs. Gandhi said this particular discontent is out of the economic crisis, because of the economic crisis. There's unemployment, no new investment is coming, and it is necessary for us to bring more investment 
expand the economy, take the economy to the people, take the economy to the rural people, take the economy to the poor people. And therefore, she began to say in both the conventions, Ahmedabad as well as Bangalore Convention of Congress, the time has come for us to take a shift. She did not use the word left. But what she was indicating was clearly what we today know as a leftist policy. Now, in 1969, it was accidental development of President Zakir Hussain's death. After Zakir Hussain's death came a crisis. It was in May 1969. And who should be the president? The right wing thought that if Mrs. Gandhi is making noises which were akin to the left, it is necessary to remove her. And so the right wing forces, along with the international forces, decided to throw out Mr. Indira Gandhi in 1969 by taking advantage of the president's election. So they chose, that is, the party chose Sanjeeva Reddy, who was sympathetic to the right wing in the Congress, to be president. Mrs. Gandhi, till almost last week, accepted the leadership of the Sanjeev Reddy to be made president. Because he was the Congress, she was also in the Congress, party had not divided. So Sanjeev Reddy was to become president if he was elected. Realizing that Sanjeev Reddy's election was actually a plot to remove her. Because once he became president, the argument was Mrs. Gandhi can be removed. Mrs. Gandhi from 1966 to 1969 was described by Lohia and Madhubi as a dumb dog. So they thought they can play along with her, actually the games as a, they would play with dumb dog. So they regarded Mrs. Gandhi as dumb dog and thought that if Sanjeev Reddy is elected as a president, the dumb dog would be sidelined totally. When Mrs. Gandhi and uh, with the help of P.N. Haksar and many others, Ramesh Thapar and many others, both Marwagal have included, P.N. Paul included, they realized that the game is on to topple her, to destabilize Indira Gandhi's government, Mrs. Indira Gandhi decided to fight back. And that fight back began soon after the presidential election. May, Zakir Hussain died, and soon after, the election came. Mrs. Gandhi openly, almost openly declared that she would support an independent candidature of Vivigiri. She did not say that in so many words. She merely said that all the members of parliament, all, all the members of legislature are free to vote according to their conscience, whoever they want to vote. It is not necessary to follow party whip of electing Sanjeev Reddy. This was a clear call to support Vivigiri. Vivigiri himself was a trade unionist. After a long battle, electoral battle, as well as, as, well as statistical battle, late in the night, Vivigiri was declared elected. That was a major setback to the right wing in the party. Now, right wing decided to take that further, their attack further, because they were upset that their strategy has failed. Sanjeev Reddy has been defeated. When they started pushing their right wing agenda, or what we today can call neoliberal agenda, Mrs. Gandhi decided to further her attack on them. And therefore, in July 1969, or June, July 1969, she expanded her attack on the right wing inside the party not only in the party conventions, but also in the ministries. You must recall that Mrs. Gandhi asked Moraji Desai, who was the Deputy Prime Minister, to resign. And resign on what count? It was essentially on the question of bank nationalization. When Mrs. Gandhi put forward the idea that banks need to be denationalized, nationalized, because by denationalization of existing, whatever small public sector was, the right wing was creating a pressure on the economy. And by nationalizing back, she would be able to counter the entire process of privatization and internationalization and globalization of economy at that time. Moraji Desai opposed. He said what we need is social control and not nationalization of the banks. When Mrs. Gandhi decided that she will, she wants to nationalize banks, she threw out Moraji Desai and Moraji Desai resigned even as a finance minister and Mrs. Gandhi declared 14 banks nationalized on 19 July. But the Debate was not over, and the fight was not over, and the struggle to continue with bank nationalization was not over, because bank nationalization was opposed both in Rajya Sabha as well as in Supreme Court. So till 1971, the thing was in called wrong between 1969 and 1971. But 19 July, when she nationalized the banks, there was a full-spirited atmosphere across the country. 
because for the first time the top industrial is the top capitalist supported by the international capital and the right wing neoliberal parties in india got a setback that government under mrs gandhi cannot be con completely controlled by them and she is not a dumb doll as they thought after bank nationalization she did not look back between bank nationalization and 1970 december when she called for midterm election to be held in 1971 she decided to take so many steps which included later on abolition of privy purses abolition of uh, land ownership declaration of uh, land sealing and all this insurance bank nationalization later on even oil nationalization all that followed after the bank nationalization policy was implemented in 1971 but actually it began in 1969 now this 1960s to 1970 period is also the period of acute cold war which i told you initially that cold war is not something which is only between soviet union and the united states the us and the european forces or what we can know as neo colonial and new imperialist forces nowadays the terms are also not used those new imperialist and neo colonial forces were trying to influence the politics inside the country they were directly helping the parties of swatantra party janasangha partly socialist parties and syndicate congress the syndicate congress jansen swatantra and socialists were the agents of this international capital of this international political line to corner indira gandhi because they were opposed and resentful of pandit nehru's policies right from start now they thought that they had an opportunity because they had a global support so the cold war had come at india's doors not with arms and armament cold war had come to india with the policy approaches with the economic policy approaches they wanted to influence the economic policies remember that was the period when vietnam war was at its peak in 1968 tet offensive vietnam had actually confronted the american forces and told the americans that you cannot win the vietnam war that actually came in 1968 and yet because of the aggressive policies of united states nixon and kissinger gang was elected in 1968 and nixon was sworn in in 1969 after he was elected he started to expand the war in vietnam and mrs indira gandhi not only nationalized banks in india not only abolished the privy purses not only further promoted the land sealing she also decided to support internationally the progressive causes and national liberation struggles whether it was in vietnam or angola mrs gandhi came openly in support of ho chi minh led vietnam war that angered nixon and kissinger so much that nixon and kissinger began to say that they will teach indira gandhi a lesson and that lesson was to be taught not by war only that lesson was to be taught by economic policies to be changed in india it just so happened partly as accident but partly also as a part of cold war cold war policies of united states that in 1971 march almost the same time when india's elections were held pakistan elections were also held and mujibur rahman under mujibur rahman awami league for the election in east pakistan which became bangladesh later on and awami league and the mujibur rahman won such a huge number of seats more than 3/4 seats that if things were followed according to the constitution of pakistan at that time mujibur rahman would have become prime minister of whole of pakistan but because of the punjabi pathani army and air force and overall punjabi pathani bureaucratic control as well as the punjabi pathani zamindari system in pakistan which are in league which are league with american state department American State Department felt that if Mujibur Rahman becomes Prime Minister, they would lose control over South Asia because Pakistan would not be in their hands. And therefore, they decided and they advised Pakistan authorities that they must finish the Bangladesh or East Pakistani movement, which became later on Bangladesh. So, in 1971 March began the attack on their own country. The attackers were Muslim. and the defenders bangladeshi were also muslim those who were raping bengali muslim women the rapists were muslim and the victims were also muslim 
so the pakistan the idea of pakistan as an islamic country was completely completely defeated because west pakistan or what we know today as west pakistan was anti east pakistan and were invading virtually east pakistan with tanks and guns as a result the movement spread more the repression from west pakistan more the freedom struggle in bangladesh began or east pakistan began and at one point between march 1971 and october 1971 mrs gandhi decided to support the bangladesh war bangladesh liberation war that angered united states and the european forces even more because before she started actually supporting the bangladesh liberation struggle she had signed indo soviet treaty in 1971 august on 9th august 1971 she signed indo soviet treaty thereby clearly say clearly telling america that you fight your cold war we will be not aligned but we are ready to align with those forces who support the progressive cause so indo soviet treaty actually began to tilt india towards soviet union and that angered the american right wing and indian right wing enormously let us not forget that including jansang and swatantra party they were not so pro bangladesh war or bangladesh liberation because they were also closely tied up with the us the bangladesh war was successful and indira gandhi became even from vaspais in vaspais terms durga now that increased her power enormously in 1971 indira gandhi actually became a leader of south asia not only a leader of south asia progressive leader of south asia not only progressive leader of south asia but a leader who can challenge the right wing globalized tendency of the united states and the right wing europe therefore mrs gandhi's name and mrs gandhi's fame became global this was unacceptable to nixon kissinger team as well as to the detractors of indira gandhi in india let us not forget that it was in 1972-73 the great mr jayaprakash narayan suddenly emerged on the scene jayaprakash narayan had taken actually sanyas political sanyas in 1958 he suddenly emerged on the scene in 1972-73 and the grand alliance which was defeated by mr indira gandhi in 1971 elections syndicate jansang swatantra and socialist that grand alliance was revived by jayaprakash narayan thereby reviving again the same economic policies which the right wing were supporting it is ironic and strange that many people in the left many people in the left many from even our comrades started supporting jayaprakash narayan there were comrades who were supporting jayaprakash narayan there were socialist sathi who were supporting jayaprakash narayan because they thought in 1973 and 74 that mrs gandhi can be thrown out with the mobilization under jayaprakash narayan the same congress mukta idea which was promoted by lohia in 1967 but after his death it was actually disarray that was picked up by jayaprakash narayan and again anti indira anti congress congress mukta movement began in 1973 1974 in the name of anti corruption movement as a result the movement spread because in 1973 74 they started even wanting to develop the economic policy which is right wing let us not forget that the idea of denationalization nobody talked of privatization in those days the idea of denationalization of banks was actually discussed again in 1973 74 not only that that planning commission should be abolished the very process of planning should be abolished was the idea being promoted in 1973 1974 and they were saying that the idea of planning has come from soviet union it's a communist idea we must not have that idea here so that all began in 1973 74 as a kind of revised program of the right wing and that too under j prakash narayan who once upon a time was a socialist and even a marxist now when in 1973 74 the jp movement began and many leftists also joined jp movement jp actually perhaps the popularity of the so called movement went to his head and he started taking position in hand political position in hand by even demanding resignation of all elected mls in gujarat under morali desai the elected mls were taken out of their houses and beaten in bihar there was similar attack on congress and the anti indira or anti congress forces began to take 
a very violent, uh, created a very, very violent atmosphere all over the country. In 1974 came the railway strike. Again, the railway strike divided the left. A section of the left supported railway strike, supported George Fernandes, and George Fernandes was saying that there is a drought all over the country, and that drought has already created, created a food crisis. In 1973, there was Israel and Arab war, which had led to further rise in the prices, oil prices. And there is crisis, which is oil crisis. So there is economic crisis, there is food crisis, there is oil crisis, and all this has created government, put government in a very difficult situation. It is time to attack government, and railway strike will further accelerate the situation, and Mrs. Gandhi will be forced to either resign or can be cornered. Mrs. Gandhi was indeed cornered. That's a fact that she was cornered. But cornered by whom? Cornered by the right and with support of certain left. So she, she decided to attack the, the so-called left and right unholy alliance by declaring emergency. All those people who talk today about emergency do not recognize the simple fact that many things in emergency went wrong, surely. Nobody defends whatever went wrong. But at the same time, the declaration of emergency cannot be seen without reference to Jai Prakash Narayan's very destructive and anarchic movement. His anarchic movement finally helped him to promote the so-called right wing to a certain extent that at one point of time, he said what India needs is a guided democracy. Guided democracy like Ayub Khan said. And not only that, in 1975, he told the army and the police, or he appealed to army and the police to not to respond, not to accept the orders of the government. It was essentially a cause of rebellion against the state. Nobody could have tolerated the cause promoted by Jay Prakash Narayan and Mrs. Gandhi did not. She realized that the right wing has now become completely obsessed with throwing out her and now it is time for her to take a firm action. The Jai Prakash Narayan movement was challenged finally by Mrs. Indira Gandhi by declaring emergency. Now, many people in the left and the right who led and participated in the movement were arrested. It is true that many things went wrong during emergency. But what most people do not recognize is the fact that why emergency came and who forced Indira Gandhi's hands to declare emergency and what happened during emergency are two separate things. Mrs. Indira Gandhi was forced to declare emergency because otherwise there was anarchy and rebellion, perhaps rebellion, if they had accepted Jai Prakash Narayan's advice and police and army had taken to the street. So emergency came and emergency, of course, this actually stabilized the economy, but it came on the background of disrupted economy and disrupted politics. In 1977, what we saw was the defeat of Indira Gandhi Congress and Janata Party came to power. Now, Janata Party again was the same forces, right-wing forces, along with the left-wing forces. And 1970 saw Rambhav Margi getting elected from Mumbai and many leftists joining Rambhav Margi's election. In 1977, even the CPM was elected in West Bengal and CPM victory in West Bengal was hailed as a great victory even by the right-wing. I don't want to go into party politics, but let us not forget that in 1977, when Janta Party was elected, Janta Party began to implement the same right-wing propaganda which had begun in 1965 after Pandit Nehru's death, which had begun in 1973 under the Jai Prakash Narayan movement, and which was being campaigned globally by the United States. But in between, some things had also changed. In 1974-75, Nixon had to resign because of the movement in the United States, the anti-war movement primarily, and in the, then it, uh, you know, catapulted into Watergate crisis. So I don't want to go into that American politics, but the fact is, American right wing was defensive in America, and Carter was elected later on in 1976. And Carter was a centrist and not a right winger like Nixon and Kissinger. So the Cold War parameters were changing, and when the Cold War parameters were changing, Indian economic policy were also undergoing a change. So in 1977, when Janata Party began to actually bring right-wing to power, let us not forget that the Planning Commission came under attack. Subramanian Swami used to give public speeches against Planning Commission. So Planning Commission was not completely abolished only by Narendra Modi in 2014. 
there was an effort to totally abolish planning commission in 1977 even some leftist leaders around with rightist leaders thought that mrs gandhi should be punished severely punished even hanged if necessary for declaring emergency to their dismay and shock their government could not last they could not last because of ideological reasons as well as administrative and political reasons and the right wing plot was defeated by their own contradictions in 1980 and mrs gandhi came back to power in fact when mrs gandhi came back to power in 1980 again the talk began that she will try to further the leftist policies she did not particularly further leftist policies but she expanded the bank nationalization by having more and more branches across india in fact today's middle class today's non banking middle class i am referring to today's middle class is entirely a product of bank nationalization in 1969 when the banks were nationalized there were hardly any branches in the rural areas peasants were not getting any loan the small farmer the small craftsman in mumbai the small industry they were not getting loan the term that we use today micro medium small industries those terms did not exist but they were there and they were held by the banks i remember touring myself as a reporter in the economic time going to villages and finding out how loans were being distributed to farmers and to craftsmen and to small traders and to small businessmen so now banks had spread out banks had completely spread out across the rural area and today's middle class is a product of that class today's peasantry i mean let us not forget that the farmers who marched in uh, on the delhi borders they also marched with tractors as many as 100000 tractors came online was it possible in 1960s to have a tractor march i remember people marching the farmers with their movements marching by feet and now even 1 lakh tractors came and all of us supported we must support the farmers movement because farmers have come to that level thanks only to bank nationalization in 1969 bank nationalization created the new kind of prosperity and the prosperity among those classes who, who never thought that their life would be better today there is a tendency of saying that what happened during the ravi atau movement or after the ravi atau movement but the fact is the ravi atau movement has helped enormously in abolition of poverty and creation of new middle class remember in 1971 when the ravi atau slogan was given by indira gandhi on the background of bank nationalization the middle class population was less than 15% today middle class population is about 40% and 40% middle class population means more than almost 35 crores now 35 crore middle class people and at that time just a few when a 8 or 10 crore middle class people today the whole consumption of the shopping malls and everywhere is essentially in the middle class middle class so large and this particularly non productive unproductive middle class in the government sector in the public sector non performing non productive sector is the base of narendra modi that class that middle class is helping narendra modi because that middle class has now after having enjoyed the benefits of left wing policies indira gandhi left wing policies pandit nehru's philosophy and pandit nehru's approach they are the beneficiaries their children today are studying in silicon valley or working in silicon valley entirely because the computerization which began in 1985 under rajiv gandhi was continuation of pandit nehru's policies of promoting technical education so pandit nehru promotion of uh, technical education indira gandhi's policy of space research rajiv gandhi's policy of cooperation they have to be seen in one single line in between the line was bank nationalization and without bank nationalization all that progress or all that prosperity could not have come to this middle class and thinking that their children can go abroad and study and become rich unfortunately after becoming rich or after becoming successful not only in india but abroad they started feeling the time has come for them to assert in a new way in a completely new way their so called identity crisis the new identity crisis they thought was they were hindus first and indians later and that began the hindutva movement actually this current hindutva movement the current hindutva movement is a product of the nri who became extremely powerful after 1988 1990 In 1988, when I first went to visit United States, the population of Indians in the people in America, Indians, Hindus, as we call them, 
was just about 8 lakhs. Today, they are more than 40 lakhs. So this population, particularly neo-rich NRI, neo-rich NRI is not only a funder to the Hindutva movement, it is also a promoter of the Hindutva movement. And actually, why Narendra Modi gets upset whenever there is a foreign press criticizing him is because he has created a new NRI support base abroad, particularly in Europe and America. So now this entire prosperity, actually, if you say, if you say, try to see the epicenter, the epicenter of economic progress of India is with the bank nationalization. It is the bank nationalization which triggered the economic progress. Many other policies came, but bank nationalization was the most crucial. And that is why the, this right-wing lobby today wants to attack bank nationalization because it is at the core, it is the epicenter, it is the trigger of the progress of Indian economy. Now, if, you, if they succeed in denationalizing or privatizing or globalizing the banks, it is essentially attacking the very progressive cause that Nehru and Indira Gandhi promoted. So today, when on 52nd anniversary of bank nationalization, when you think of bank nationalization, it should not be merely thought in the context of bank employees. What will happen to bank employees if banks are privatized or denationalized? I think that is not the only question. That is one question. Essentially, denationalization or privatization of banks is reversing the clock, reversing the clock to such an extent that will go back fundamentally to right-wing policies and that will not stop merely at that. That will not merely stop at Hindutva politics. It will become a Hindutva neoliberal politics and slowly, as already has started happening, the public sector in general will go on safe. As already we are seeing, LIC is being given IPO permission and LIC is being nationalized. And all the so-called Ratnas, which are known as public sector, they are also being denationalized or privatized and are being sold to the FDI, the Foreign Direct Investment. So bank attack on bank nationalization actually proves that it is attack on not only banks, but across the board on the economic policy. Now, this is a sovereign, this is an attack on the sovereign economic policies of the country. And therefore, we have to resist. And therefore, I would urge, though I'm not a member of the AIBA, I would urge on AIBA to take lead, not only in taking bank employees to fight, but bring all other trade unions, insurance, and not only the white collar unions like bank, HIL, central government, public sector unions, but even the factories unions, all the trade unions under AIBA flag or with AIBA, a kind of a united front of the trade union movement, which should be initiated and promoted by AIBA because, as I said, it is the bank nationalization in 1969 which created this atmosphere and that atmosphere can be preserved and promoted and propagated only by people who are at the center of that economic issue. And economic issue or political issue are same. Never, there is nothing like politics and there is nothing like economic. They are not mutually exclusive. They are interdependent and if economics is progressive, politics will be progressive. If economics is regressive, politics will be regressive. Let us not imagine that we can have a progressive political movement and economic regressive movement. Economic regression will result into political regression, which is already happening. And it is necessary to fight that political regression by taking economy in our command. It is not uh, fashionable nowadays to quote Mao Zedong. But Mao Zedong said, politics should be in command. That at least portion of Mao Zedong's statement is correct. Politics should be in command. Unfortunately, today, neither the trade union movement nor the so-called left parties see politics as to be in commanding heights. It is not only the economy to be in commanding heights of the public sector. Also, politics has to be in commanding heights of the progressive forces. So I feel that many of the leftists Many of the leftists who were persuaded of actually joined Lohia in 1967, who joined Jayaprakash Narayan in 1973, who joined V.P. Singh in 19, 1989, and who joined the so-called Congress Mukta Bharat movement promoted by BJP. And finally, that Congress Mukta BJP movement is boomeranging on this left. And therefore, it is necessary for the entire left of the progressive people's supporters to take cudgels in hand and fight all these forces without which our country is actually going towards terrible crisis. And perhaps in the next three years, with or without COVID, we will face terrible economy 
as neither foreign investment is coming nor Indian investment is growing and banks are being privatized to the banker of industrial houses here or abroad. Now, when the banks are sold to banker of industrial houses, they'll further, they'll further denude the banking system, the economic system, as is already happening. Today, their government is not ready to give the list of NPAs and who are actually the defaulters. Defaulters of billions of rupees, defaulters of billions of rupees, which is actually nothing but stolen money of the Indian people, that must, we must force them to announce the NPAs and punish those who are formally and actually defaulting with full consciousness. But unfortunately, the movement of the left and the progressive forces is not strong enough. And therefore, I appeal again on the 52nd anniversary of Bank Nationalization that you take a lead, you are authorized to take the lead because you have a legacy, you have a tradition, you have an ideology, and you have a program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. As usual, it was uh, very interesting and inspiring. And uh, you had actually taken us to that period, the entire gamut of the political situation at that time, and the various undercurrents going on, and how ultimately the nationalization took place. So I think, especially for the uh, new generation of bank employees, uh, this would have been very, very useful, very useful, because uh, bank nationalization is a completely a political decision, and you have narrated the compulsions and the development of weavers. So that way it was uh, very nice. Thank you very much. And uh, I request uh, Nandu Chavanji to kindly thank him and propose a water tax. Thank you very much, sir. Nandu? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. No, you have to unmute. Comrade Nandu, you have to unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, we are very much uh, thankful to you, uh, uh, Kumar Ketkarji, uh, for elaborating, uh, uh, the, I mean, your lecture on the development, uh, what has happened in, uh, since 1960s till today, what is the uh, current political situation or situation in the past and uh, banking. Uh, bank nationalization, where we are, bank uh, uh, we are working in nationalized banks. And uh, it is, in fact, according to you and according to uh, uh, each one of us, is an epic center. And therefore, we have been, for last more than three decades, we have been con continuously fighting against, uh, against this uh, 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 increasing in, uh, NPAs and also government plans from right from the disinvestment of capital to till uh, 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 i mean last budget session where they have openly said two public sector banks will be uh, na nationalized uh, I, I, all that uh, uh, is really uh, we are fighting against that situation uh, we have fought against all type of situation in past also and now also uh, against the bjp government uh, we are already uh, amidst the struggle against uh, privatization and uh, I mean, uh, uh, saving nationalization. And uh, we are not only, uh, I mean, as uh, you have said uh, once that uh, you said that uh, bank employees, uh, uh, you are, uh, we are not only fighting for bank employees, we are also fighting for uh, this nationalized banks, where that it means uh, uh, it's a common people's money, which is being uh, uh, looted by the various corporates by uh, not paying loans. Against that also, uh, they, they, there is a movement we are continuously uh, we are fighting our general secretary and president were once uh, uh, taken to uh, police station also for uh, going on strike. So that way, we are not uh, lagging behind uh, uh, with your support as a journalist also and as a Congress MP also. I think in uh, coming days, we will uh, try to stop these uh, uh, such efforts from the BJP government, you 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 are elaborate uh, lecture today. You are really enthused us, enlightened us, enriched us, and I, we hope and we hope to see you in some other forum 
uh, in future. Thank you very much for sparing your time. Uh, on behalf of All India Bank employees, our President and General Secretary, we thank you very much for sparing your time for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kit Kaji. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. And before we close, uh, announcement is that tomorrow we have same time four o'clock. Uh, Mr. P. Sainath, he will be talking to us uh, tomorrow in our uh, webinar session. And uh, the subject is also very, very important that you will talk. The state that we are in. That means, where are we in the present, what emerging situation and uh, current uh, development. So it will be highly uh, informative and educative. And all of us know, like uh, our Ketkar Ji, Sainath also started as a journalist and now I have blossomed into a full-time social activist and we are very happy that tomorrow he'll be addressing. So we thank you and uh, we request all of you to kindly tune in the same time at 3.55 tomorrow, 4 to 5. Don't miss the wonderful lecture of Mr. Sainath. That will be very, very, very important to us. I'm sure that all of our uh, members will further, uh, I mean, uh, inform all of our people across the country and more number of people will be uh, attending this uh, program. With this, once again, thanking all of you and with the permission of our president, Comrade Rajan Nagar, we are coming to the close of uh, today's webinar. Thank you, sir, and thank you very much to all of you. Bye.